we'll get started um, while we wait for a few more to join us, um, just to make sure we have time for everything. So thank you for joining us um, this evening or morning, depending on where you are in the world, for our international speaker series on climate finance with Amali Amin, Sandra Guzman and Natalie Unterstel, called Charlie Keeling Aho. I'm a senior advisor in the communications and engagement team at the commission, and I will shortly explain how the session will run today. But before I do that, I'm going to ask Bevan, Principal Advisor, Māori Corporate Services, to lead us into this session with a karakia. Uh, kia ora tato. Uh, ngā mihi nui ki a koutou, i runga i te pao ka whakata a reo nei, a tēnā koutou katoa. He honore tēnei, ko a tai mai a Sandra, a Natalie, um, hoki, hoki atu ki a koe a Māli, a tēnā tātou katoa. A nei, he karakia, poto, poi poi a te Māori, poi poi a te wairua. Poi poi a te tapu, poi poi a te whenua o Papa Tuanuku. For those of us who speak English, that, um, the translation for that karakia is nurture the life force, nurture the spirit, nurture the sacredness, nurture the lands that sustain us, Mother Earth. And a special acknowledgement to our, our guest speakers. Thank you all for coming. Kia ora. Kia ora, Pam. Kia ora, Bevan. Thank you. Um, so before we kick off, for those of you who are familiar with these sessions will be used to this, it would be great if you could please write your name and the organisation or community you represent into the chat box while I'm talking and let us know where you're joining us from in the world. Since we can't see your faces, it's always really good to know who we have participating in these sessions. This is the fifth session in our international speaker series and we're very privileged to have our speakers join us today alongside the chair of our commission, Dr. Rod Carr and Deputy Chair Lisa Tumahai who will both be hosting this session for us today. Rod is the former Vice Chancellor for the University of Canterbury, former Chair of the Reserve Bank of New Zealand, founding Chair of the National Infrastructure Advisory Board and businessman with a PhD in Insurance and Risk Management. Lisa was Deputy Chairperson of the Interim Climate Change Committee and is a leader within Naitahu. She has established relationships with Iwi and Māori and will help to ensure the broader Commission has a great, a greater understanding of Te Ao Māori perspectives. Amalie, Sandra and Natalie will shortly introduce themselves and share more information on their backgrounds and this will be followed by a discussion with Rod and Lisa. You will then have the opportunity to ask questions. You should see a Q&A box at the bottom of the screen or you can type your questions throughout. We might not have a chance to cover all questions in the session but we will try to get to as many as we can and if you'd like to speak to each other or share your thoughts please feel free to use the chat it's always good to see your conversations and can be a great space to share your thoughts and any helpful resources. Um, and we are recording this session, so anyone who is unable to make it is able to watch it on our website afterwards. So I'm now going to hand over to our speakers um, and we will get going with the session. Kia ora, everyone. Hi, good, good morning, good evening, good afternoon. Uh, so my name is Amelia Min. I'm uh, currently at CDC, which is the UK's Development Finance Institute, so not the Centre for Disease Control um, uh, in the US. And uh, so uh, we're, we're basically an impact investor. And I'll, I'll just say a little bit about how, how I got here. Um, so I, uh, I basically did a degree in environmental science back in 1990. I started and, and became, incre basically my biggest concern was how to increase access to energy for all and the poorest uh, people in the world uh, whilst tackling climate change. So I've then uh, did a PhD looking at renewable energy, how to promote renewable energy in developing countries and have pretty much been trying to implement it ever since. I worked in the UK government for 10 years in various roles. I worked at a think tank, E3G, uh, looking at international climate finance and then for seven years at the Multilateral Development Bank, um, where I was a chief of climate change until February 2020 um, uh, at the Inter-American Development Bank. So that's the regional development bank for Latin America and the Caribbean where I had the great pleasure to work with Sandra, actually, uh, in her role in the Mexican government uh, and civil society. And uh, so the reason I joined CDC was because um, uh, we're an impact investor, but we only invest in Africa and South Asia. 
And I really believe that all investment now has to be about positive impact, impact to deliver on the sustainable development goals. So for me, this was a new challenge to understand uh, what, what that means in practice uh, and how in particular the private sector is thinking about impact investing. So uh, I'm delighted to be joining you for this event. And thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you so much, Amali. And well, very nice to meet you, everyone. My name is Sandra Guzman. I'm a social scientist and a climate activist. I'm originally from Mexico. And I'm the founder of the Climate Finance Group for Latin America and the Caribbean, which is an NGO, it's a think tank that aims to promote the transformation of the financial sector, starting with the decarbonization of the public finance sector. And what we do is try to promote this based on a number of principles. We believe that it's important to achieve this transformation, but based on principles such as transparency, respect of human rights, gender equity, and of course, sustainability. For us, talking about sustainable finance or climate finance is not only about um, like how we are going to increase uh, sustainable investments, but how we are going to decrease those investments that are creating the problem. So for us, it is very important to have a balance in this, in this equation. Uh, probably the three key motivations that have been um, uh, yeah, pushing our work is, is how we are going to change a, a structural a problems that we see in the, in the climate finance debate. So the first problem that we see is that we need to start changing the narrative around climate finance. For many years, we have been talking about the necessity to support the poorest, the vulnerable ones, but in a kind of a condescending approach. And I think we need to change this. We need to start talking about how we are going to invest in transformative approaches, supporting developing countries in really generate new ways to do, to do things, how to leapfrog those um, uh, pathways uh, that are really creating the problems such as extractive uh, activities in, in these countries. And we need to build more trust but if we do not change this approach, we are not going to create more trust between the different countries. The second point is that definitely we have to acknowledge that developing countries are not, it's not an homogeneous group. It's not that we are talking about the same, when we talk about the different countries, we need to acknowledge that they have different needs. We are talking about emerging markets that as you know, are becoming also quite problematic. Some countries like Mexico or Brazil or others that are, participating in the, in the mission. So it's how we are going to uh, achieve the decarbonization of, of the financial sector in these countries without necessarily uh, thinking that they are not um, vulnerable because they are vulnerable, but they are also very responsible of, of the changes. And of course we have uh, least developing countries that need more support to, cre to create uh, prosperity plans as the vulnerable forums is, is promoting. So we need to start breaking these vicious cycles. Countries are still, still um, relying a, a lot in extractive activities to generate revenue. So we have to transform those approaches to, to invest in better ways to do things. And definitely one of the key elements that I think is going to be very interesting to talk in this conversation is how we, how we are going to balance the conversation between adaptation and mitigation. We, don't, we cannot uh, deal and tackle climate change if we only focus on mitigation. We have to start talking about adaptation in a deeper way and they do not behave the same. We cannot just deal with adaptation with one project. It's not something that we will change in one year. We have to talk about processes. And in this sense, I think the climate finance approaches need to, need to be flexible and adapt in the context of climate change and particularly in the context of the pandemic. So all of these issues, I think, are going to be very interesting to, 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 to discuss in this conversation. So I'm very, very happy to be here. And I thank you for the invitation to have this conversation with all of you. Thank you so much. Hello, I'm Natalia Unterstel. I come from Brazil. It's lovely to be here with you. Thank you so much for, in, for this invitation. And a little bit about myself, um, I started my career working uh, with indigenous peoples in the Amazon rainforest in here. Uh, my background was is in public policy, so I was working with them to try to find new models for sustainable development that were compatible with their own ideas of development. And I ended up working on 
uh, the fight against deforestation and in the first arrangements around rewarding uh, the reduction of deforestation um, by uh, in and by developing countries like Brazil uh, by the international community. So that uh, got me into the international negotiations, also got me into government uh, policy making. So I've uh, worked uh, in the Brazilian government at the federal level, in the Ministry of the Environment, in the presidency, also at the subnational uh, governments as well. And um, more, more recently, uh, I was the co-chair of the Brazilian Forum on Climate Change, which is somehow an equivalent version of uh, your commission, but unfortunately no longer so active as in the past because we are now facing a quite uh, unusual uh, political uh, situation in here. But currently uh, I'm a member of the accreditation panel of the Green Climate Fund, which is basically this body within the fund that helps the fund to establish a uh, partnership with different uh, financial institutions. Uh, and I'm also the founder of a policy think tank based here in Brazil, which is called Talanoa. And uh, we are working um, on making the low carbon transition a reality in here. So once again, thank you so much for this invitation. And I'm very excited about the questions and the discussions that we're gonna have. Rod and Lisa, over to, over to you. So kia ora everybody, uh, and, and at some risk, I'm gonna jump in with a question for our panel. But first of all, thank you very much to our panelists. Um, I'm the chair of our Climate Change Commission and our initial body of work has focused on providing advice to the government on New Zealand's emissions budget and a reduction plan. But when New Zealand signed up for its nationally determined contribution back in 2015, it was always clear that we were going to meet part of our NDC through offshore mitigation. So one of my questions for, for each of you is how confident are you that during this decade, we will develop a range of robust ways of measuring permanent additionality that countries like New Zealand will be able to have confidence when we make transfer payments to help the world because it goes beyond what we believe we alone can do domestically, that we will get verifiable value for those transfers. Is this a definitely will happen or a probably will happen or much work to be done and a real challenge? I'm interested in your perspectives on that question. Who wants to go first? <laughs> well, I can go. I can go if okay. um, <laughs> I, I can go first. <laughs> Thank you so much, Rod. Um, I, I definitely think that uh, there is um, uh, there is a there is a deep uh, problematic approach when we talk about uh, these um, uh, market mechanisms to exchange uh, emissions, and I think we have to discuss that market mechanisms are just one, one type of mechanism. So we have to really put in, in, in practice all sort of different policies and then mar carbon market should be more complementary. However, some countries, as you mentioned, are seeing carbon markets as the main um, mechanisms to reduce emissions. And I think the, the um, I wouldn't say that we are 100% confident about this approach because it's not transformational. As I was saying, the key element is to really start uh, creating mechanisms to invest in technologies and to invest in projects that will uh, decarbonize and that will transform the type of uh, activities that we are doing. For instance, I'm from Mexico. Uh, and Mexico is a country that was receiving quite a lot of um, projects from the CDM, the Clean Development uh, Mechanism, but that doesn't necessarily, uh, that doesn't end up in, in, in a lot of uh, reduction of emissions, no? So we, we couldn't uh, really ensure that did, that happened. And in that sense, the key question is, 
are the countries doing enough nationally to do the reduction of emissions or are just looking for the carbon markets as a way to, to you know, like extrapolate the, the responsibilities? And, and I think this is a, a deeper conversation. I think that Article 6 in the context of the international negotiations will be important, but if that mechanism do not ensure that we will deeply transform the sectors, I don't think that is going to be effective to reduce emissions. So we have to start really digging deeper in, in how we are going to transform. A, the, a, and we have to acknowledge that certain um, activities such as the fossil fuel industry has to change in, in the coming uh, years. And we cannot just keep them alive and using carbon capture and storage on, on market mechanisms to to keep them alive, uh, just to 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 extra well to extrapolate the emissions. So I, I'm not sure. I, I, in my point of view, I don't think that carbon market mechanisms will be the the bullet, uh, the 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 silver bullet that we need. They will be complementary, yes, but not necessarily the ones that will actually deal with the problem in a structural way. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, Natalie, do you have do you have a, a view? <laughs> I do, I do. I'm perhaps a little bit more positive than Sandra about the role of the, this specific market mechanisms, although I, I completely agree with her that we cannot bet on only one specific tool, for sure that's not, uh, that's not the case. Uh, But in terms of what the options, uh, what options do we have on the table? At least three, uh, or you would have uh, in terms of offshore um, results you could count in, at least for a certain period of time. First of all, we're talking about the international transfers of mitigation uh, options, the the ITMOS, um, which are under discussion right now under Article 6 of the Paris Agreement, We are seeing uh, positive developments by Switzerland, which entered already agreements with uh, several countries, Peru, uh, Vanuatu, and others, uh, I think Ghana as well. And I think that's uh, that's a very interesting model they are piloting because they are not only like uh, buying the results, right, and and transferring them, but they are also financing upfront uh, development of clean energy, for instance, in areas that are that this is so much needed. So I think this is one way forward. I would like to see more demand actually for for this type of transfers. Uh, and uh, the issue, as you mentioned, is to ensure that this is going to be permanent and additional, right? And I think we need a clear rule book, a clear guidebook, and that's why the Article Six negotiations are so crucial right now. There is the other option, which is the six six dot four article of the the Paris. Um, negotiations, which is basically on projects. I think we had learned a lot from the past from CDM, right? We know what doesn't work. Uh, At least we have a lot of experience and we can learn uh, about that. But something that um, strikes me is that we're now in a different uh, model. We're not no longer under Kyoto Kyoto Protocol. We're no longer like establishing a international regulation and then uh, we are counting on NDCs, right? So I have some concerns around how projects will deliver results and how we're going to discount this results from NDC, so on and so forth. Um, and finally, I think there is this opportunity of linking markets, link, linking ETS. New Zealand, uh, to my knowledge, has a, a, this uh, trade scheme in place. So maybe uh, establishing this interlinkage with other markets, it's, it's, uh, it's very good. So options are there. I do believe they're going to be uh, developed in, during this decade and will help those that need to achieve the 2030 targets. All right, and uh, last but not least, what I am basically concerned in terms of what we have here in Brazil, it's uh, um, the, the, what's gonna happen with avoided emissions. As you may know, Brazil has had a lot in the past. We had se- seven gigatons of emissions reduced from deforestation. We were very successful, 80% reduction of deforestation in the Amazon. I hope we get back to those levels uh, pretty soon. But basically those are not as of today part of any market mechanisms. And uh, if they do become part, which is always like a possibility, uh, there will be an issue of permanence there. So I just want to raise this flag uh, here because yes, we can count 
on Brazil to, you know, delivered results at some point, but making those results like offsets, I'm not very sure, or ITMOS, I'm not very sure that's the best way forward. I think it's another type of finance. It's results-based finance. And of course, extremely important, right? We won't get to net zero if we don't uh, end deforestation in the tropics. But that's another conversation, and I just wanted to make clear here that it's another, it, you wouldn't necessarily count them as offshore um, results into your 2030 NDC. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, no, I think, I mean, a lot of what, what uh, was just said, I, you know, I, 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 yeah, really agree with. Um, I mean, I think. I personally think the concept of ITMOS is can be very interesting. Uh, however, um, it's you know we are as as Natalie said we're in a very very different context than the Kyoto Protocol, and you know as Sandra said it's really you know how do, how do these how can market mechanisms really have that transformative impact? And I think ITMOS potentially where you see countries that have quite that really need to step up their 2030 uh, ambition uh, whilst on the other hand there will be other countries in the developing world particularly the less developed countries that we know need to increase their emissions uh, I mean obviously decoupling their emissions from economic growth but uh, in many of the countries we invest in in Africa you know they have massive unmet energy demand I mean they really you know in uh, DRC, where you know, I mean, a small percentage. I think uh, you know, one in ten people don't have. Um, uh, only one in ten people have access to you know a sort of um, modern form of energy service. And so, uh, can this up front, you know, front loading the finance to enable? Uh, the less developed countries to actually then, you know, really invest more in renewable energy, battery storage that we know is now becoming feasible, but is still very expensive um, to enable them to have a, you know, deep decarbonized growth path uh, whilst increasing ambition in countries like Switzerland over the shorter period um, to 2020, 2030, I think is actually a really interesting uh, concept. Um, but I do, uh, I do think, um, you know, we have to stop thinking that it's about offsetting. Uh, all countries have to get to net zero. We know that. Uh, and all parts of the economy ultimately need to be contributing uh, in, in some way. So um, it can't be as simple as purchasing credits from, you know, from another country. It has to be about transformation and about, you know, being uh, consistent with and delivering that pathway to net zero by 2050. Thank you. Uh, Lisa, your turn. <laughs> oh. Have we got Lisa there? Hi, Lisa. I think you're on mute, Lisa. Sorry, my yeah. uh, system is not doing what it's supposed to do. Sorry, um, have a Q&A. <laughs> um, this is from uh, Martin Fryer. We're experiencing a significant and rapid global shift in investments into renewable energy products. Do the panel think the associated current impact reporting through example green and climate bonds are currently sufficient to measure the impact in relation to global decarbonisation. Um, maybe, maybe I'll start with that. I mean, I think that that's, I think, a very interesting question. I think what we're seeing now is. Um, uh, some very good standards around different types of green bonds and to a large extent, particularly as we look at countries that are developing taxonomies on green finance, um, we will probably start to see more sort of sh different shades of green bonds, you know, from dark green to light green, um, which, you know, I think is obviously, 
you know, the way, uh, you know, what is needed in terms of developing um, uh, a market that uh, w- where these bonds can really be, you know, where there's real transparency around what they are financing. And that's, you know, absolutely essential. I think at the moment, though, um, that's probably a little bit removed from a lot of the discussions around pathways to net zero. Um but that has definitely got to be part of the agenda moving forward. Uh, we see, you know, the financial sector making all these commitments to net zero. Um, Mark Carney recently um, with the uh, UNEP FI, um, they launched uh, this new, uh, it's called the Glasgow Finance Alliance for Net Zero, where you have um, the Alliance for Net Zero um, asset managers, asset owners, uh, insurers, I mean, the, they're representing trillions, trillions of investment, trillions of, of dollars of investment. And so uh, it's going to be essential that we have um, transparency and we create standards around uh, how they are working to deliver uh, and how they're moving on a pathway to net zero. And that has to be, it can't be just about divesting from the, the bad stuff. Uh, which is happening and I think, you know, it, it needs to happen. But it's also about investing in the real economy that is needed to deliver the uh, net zero and uh, also climate resilient transition that all countries are needed. And so I think at some point, uh, probably in, you know, in the next couple of years, really, there will need to be a much greater focus both on what those pathways are within the financial sector and how then the standards around green bonds, climate bonds are enabling uh, those pathways to be delivered. So I think that's very, uh, yeah, a very key point that has been raised. I think a, a lot more work needs to be done though in that respect. Yeah, I, I would like to comment also in that in that question, in, and I agree with, with Amalie's perspective. And I think there are a number of, of elements that explain the, the rapid growth in, in, in shifting investments in renewable energy. And of course, the, the first point is that the demand is increasing and that is, 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 is creating that the, the prices and the cost of the renewable energy is coming, is, is declining as well, so it's decreasing. And that is creating, a, a, is giving a major opportunity to, to start thinking in, in renewable energy as a, as, a, as a major opportunity to invest. But I think that here, we have to think in, in the combination of, of actors. So of course we need these uh, uh, investments. And I think, I think um, green bonds or cl- uh, climate bonds on, or, or this type of bonds are very important. But I think it is important also to consider the sustainability of these bonds. No? Like it's how often you're going to emit these bonds to ensure that those investments will continue over the time. No, Because we see uh, countries that are emitting these bonds and, and suddenly uh, one year they do it, but probably not in, in the next two or three years. And how you really show that those investments will continue to sustain the, that, the transformation process, because I think this is important to create not only the, um, um, the certainty about these investments in the future, but also it's a, it's a message, the message that you are sending to the, to the market. But definitely here, it's very important the participation of the state and also creating the, the right incentives, the right policies, the right, the right regulations to, to start not only creating this opportunity to, to create, um, to emit these, these bonds voluntarily, but starting to really create more, um, let's say, a bi- legally binding kind of a, a mechanisms that will help to ensure that that uh, sustainability in the time. So I think definitely it is important to think what are the elements that need to happen in the public sector and what are the, the, the things that have to happen in the private sector and in the financial sector to start um, connecting the dots. And I'm saying this because in some countries like, like Mexico, unfortunately, like the, the signs from the poli- public sector are not very um, uh, consistent. No, We are emitting these green bonds but we are creating policies that are completely in the go to the completely opposite side of the of the conversation. So I think it's very important to, to discuss the relevance of these bonds and create systems to, to ensure that they are sustainable in the time and that we are keeping uh, creating these mechanisms in the future. Thank you, Lisa. Sure. 
Ashley. Just a quick uh, compliment to, to what Amalie and Sandra already mentioned. I think in short, we see some evidence in, in the literature around uh, bonds uh, that uh, they become more effective if they are externally verified. So this is uh, certainly what we need. We need some sort of guardrails uh, around bonds and uh, the same for net zero commitments, right? We need some guardrails because uh, it's so important from an investor perspective, but also from the policy perspective that the net zero trajectories are real and are verifiable. And at the same time, there's so much appetite at the moment for, for bonds that we also need guardrails to understand that this is leading us to where we really need. And this is applicable not only to clean energy, but also to the land use sector, which is another one uh, that is currently like booming in, in, in particular in, in terms of green bonds. So I think it's up to us uh, to establish those guardrails and to establish um, more particularly this external verification um, at speed. <laughs> Thank you. And I think talking about um, the creation of standards, I think Rod, we'll go back to you so that you can uh, raise an issue you talked about yesterday around greenwashing. Mm. Yeah, thank you, Lisa. So, so obviously one of the questions that emerges is this verification that what is claimed is delivered. Uh, and one level of that is obviously uh, the desire for nation states to raise their level of ambition and the interest that mm -hmm. the private sector has in looking green. And so my question is in two parts for the panel. Really, the first is, is there a risk that we simply push ambition to unrealistic levels compared to the action which is actually undertaken and in the process um, lose the ability to carry uh, voters and democracies on this 30-year journey? And how do we make sure that the greenwashing doesn't undermine and debase entirely uh, the currency uh, that we need, which is that we need verifiable transformation of the finance sector to ensure that the transition is funded. So ambition and action and verification and greenwashing. Um, how anxious should we be that at Glasgow we are simply going to raise the level of promise and inevitably lead to disappointed expectations. So why don't we start with Natalie? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that. Uh, first of all, I think that's a, that's a great question and I'm not sure I do have the answer to, to that because this is an ongoing process. Uh, but first of all, you're completely right in, in raising the risk uh, or not raising the risk, raising um, this issue of, yes, we do have the risk here of establishing uh, commitments that are not realistic, right? And, and that's at the, I think that's at the heart of uh, the COP26 and even like at the Race to Zero campaign, so on and so forth. So in my point of view, what's happening currently is that we do have a very special moment uh, or momentum. We are seeing, as Sandra mentioned, this technological breakthroughs. It's the technologies, solar, uh, wind are uh, growing exponentially. So we do have some... Uh, good news and tipping points in terms of technology that can, that can move us forward. We do have some communities like the financial community, uh, which is um, very, it's highly educated at the moment and it's really like becoming more and more conscious of the climate risks and embedding that into decision making. So I think this is part of the good news. And we do have social movements all over the world that are pushing uh, the 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 ambition uh, forward and also trying to take uh, the like the social license for fossil fuel industry, the forestation linked industries to operate. So I think this is on the good side. This is what's pushing us to where we need to go to. On the other side, we have the incumbents and we do have um, sectors that are not going to, uh, you know, give uh, give up for free. <laughs> And they're fighting this fight with us. And I think it's uh, real everywhere from New Zealand to Brazil, Mexico, UK. They are there. They're not, yeah, they're, they don't want to be losers, right? 
everybody wants to be winners. And overall, because we do have this battle and, and we have to frame a, as such, uh, we need to be realistic in terms, I think, of the milestones. So instead of just talking about net zero, which is great, I think we work it so hard to get this long-term vision, so let's not get rid of it. Uh, but we need this five, 10-year uh, milestones with us. And that's why I think we need to put much more energy right now in what's our end goal for 2030? Where do we need to go to be? Five, 50% uh, less emissions than we had, um, than we... 50% of the emissions we had in, in, in 1990, and, and we need to be very clear about that. And, and then try to make this matching between what's going on in the real economy, what's going on in all those movements that I mentioned, and the climate diplomacy, because I think the, the, there is a mismatch right now. The indices are not reflecting what we do have in the real world. We don't see the technology, technological breakthroughs necessarily. We don't see the voices of the different communities being heard. So I think there is something here. There is a great task to be uh, finished by governments, which is to try to match and try to be more, more connected to what their communities are talking about. So in one sense, I'm positive about uh, this ambition task because I think it's a much more a matter of like trying to, to hear more those that are pushing for more ambition than those who are actually trying to lower down the commitments we have. On the verification side, and I will try to be brief here, uh, on the verification side, I'm seeing some positive uh, uh, moves uh, also by like Oxford University and others that are working together with the Race to Zero campaign, for instance, to, to try to establish the standards. I think that's what we need. Also like science-based target. So all of these initiatives, they can help us a lot with what, uh, what we need in terms of uh, matching this ambition. But uh, then talking about uh, developing nations, the problem is that this is not yet uh, being translated. This is not yet coming to where we need. So there is much more to be done. Uh, I don't know if that's the situation in New Zealand. We don't have the language barrier necessarily uh, for like Spanish and Portuguese countries uh, have, but I, I do think that we, we need to expand this work much further and make it available, make it a reality, a reference point to all countries, all the 195 nations that are um, under the, the Paris Agreement. Mm -hmm. So maybe I'll come in and I might start with the second question first, just because uh, Natalie referred to this, uh, some the work that's being led by Oxford University. And actually, I'm, I'm a member of uh, the finance sector expert group that is actually looking at exactly these issues. So um, uh, the Race to Zero has an expert group that looks at corporates and uh, verify, assesses the extent to which their commitments are, um, you know, credible and uh, basically will start to look at some verification of those over time. But then it was recognized for the financial sector where you're not a corporate, you're not, I mean, where your business is financing others' business, <laughs> it's a bit more complex. And, you know, as you start to think of, you know, scope three emissions and, you know, how, how what that, that means in practice. So uh, that is also work that's, as, as Natalie said, I mean, it's very much underway. It is quite complex for the financial sector. There aren't many uh, sort of as many methodologies out there. Oh, in fact, there's virtually nothing, but uh, the science-based target initiative are actually working on one uh, as we speak with, uh, in fact, this group I'm involved in will be uh, contributing to that. So absolutely essential and important and um, work in progress. Um, on the other question, I, you know, I think you're absolutely right. The, you know, you know, we need to avoid sort of setting what may be seen as unrealistic uh, levels ambition. But on the other hand, I think when we look at the net zero by 2050 um, commitment that all parties uh, to the Paris Agreement have signed up to effectively, as the IPCC has shown that, you know, 1.5 degrees uh, basically means net zero by 2050. Um, 
when we look at that, I mean, that's a that's a 30 year sort of time frame. I think what's really important, in addition to the NDCs, what's really important is for countries, all countries, is to develop their longer term strategies. So work out what's the pathway to getting to net zero in 2050 and then work backwards to understand what does that mean for decisions to be made now. And I think in doing so, it also allows governments to understand where there may be some uh, transition risks where uh, the issue of a just transition becomes important, i.e. where there may be some risks to certain workers, certain communities, uh, typically as you know, uh, communities that may be heavily reliant on coal production, uh, coal mining, and then coal power production. Um, you know, how to uh, to be able to anticipate uh, the, where that sh those shifts are, go are coming, are going to be needed, and then start to work to uh, look at creating other economic activities in those areas. I mean, that's got to be part of of the agenda now uh we know that i think you know climate of course it's a huge environmental challenge but it's also a massive social and economic challenge but if we get it right and if governments uh can you know take on that sort of you know see where the long-term pathway or what the long-term vision is i think there is a responsibility to work with uh, civil society with citizens with workers with you know with communities to actually put in place those measures that will enable a really uh, you know a transition that actually brings benefits to all and really captures what can be many new opportunities for growth economic growth in terms of new jobs uh, new sources of of income so you know I think yes uh, it's a challenge, but I think you know that that's really the role of governments is to set that vision and then work with others to deliver on that. I just want to add a very quick, quick, quick point regarding this this thing, and I just think that the net zero targets or whatever we want to call it uh, as goals, we need to set principles as well. Um, so how we're gonna get there. And, and what type of mechanisms we'll use to get there. Because uh, sometimes we are uh, misleading the, com the, the conversation. So we are saying, okay, we don't want to keep investing in coal, let's invest in gas because it has less emissions. But it's, it's a tricky one because uh, gas at the end of the day is a fossil fuel. And now plenty of countries are saying, okay, let's do fracking because uh, it's a technology that will get, uh, help us to, to, to do gas instead of coal. So it's like, how we're gonna set a number of principles to avoid like using technologies that will create more externalities, environmental and social externalities that will end up increasing the problem. So I think we have to uh, be very, in that sense, I completely agree with the, the um, external analysis about these targets. And I would close saying that um, in this point, it's very, very important that the private sector that is part of this, all of these alliances are also following and, and working together with the public sector in the, in the achievement of, of, of the targets that the countries are, are establishing. Because now the private sector is going in one side and the public sector is, is going in parallel and they are not working necessarily together to achieve the goals that have the, that the countries are, are establishing at the national level through the NDCs or others. Actually, increasing ambition can be a very good exercise uh, working together, how the private sector will help the public sector to achieve what they established and more, because the NDCs are obviously not enough, right? The, the plenty of studies are telling us that the NDCs are very limited because countries are scared of, of being too ambitious because then they will have a lot of demands from the civil society and, and, and others. So I think it is very important to, to have these rules and these principles and set these principles also in a in non not only in a voluntary way because we have all these alliances in the run towards COP26 all of them are voluntary right they are just a, how we're going to establish certain processes that accelerate the the implementation of these of, of these mechanisms to ensure that this will happen and, and, and not necessarily just because we are all excited about the COP, but actually how they are going to implement them in the, in the, in the coming uh, years. Thank you. 
good segue into the next question, which is from Regan uh, Smithwaite. So I hope I've pronounced that right, Regan. Um, to what extent is climate finance attempting to shift the narrative around climate change and renewable energy? The fossil fuel industry has been telling the world that climate change is not caused by humans, while also encouraging individual action rather than systemic change in policy and industry. How's climate finance going on the offensive to create demand widespread support for transformational systems change? I can start and try to be very brief. Um, but I, I do see the divest invest narrative as a very powerful one, which is delivering in some communities at least uh, a lot. So uh, particularly uh, in the US at the moment, uh, we do see that a lot of universities, a lot of um, church-based communities, uh, they are divesting, but they are also redirecting those resources to, to clean energy and, and to this new economy. Right. And we are not talking about millions nor billions. We're talking about trillions of dollars that are being redirected. And I think this uh, adds to the perspective that Sandra uh, brought uh, to us before on uh, really setting this um, into movement and, and, and playing with the market forces as well. So I do see this uh, as a very powerful uh, social movement at the moment, and that may change, and it's changing already since 2015 at least, the way that we are tackling uh, the problem. So people are no longer talking about redu reducing emissions per se, but keeping oil on the ground, keeping gas on the ground. And I think that makes a, a whole difference also to communities that are that are seeing the problem right now. It's not only, not only about the atmosphere or something super, um, you know, like the air, it's really about something physical and that we do have the power to make decisions about, although um, they're not easy and, and they will cost uh, jobs uh, to some, but can also open opportunities and jobs uh, in other manners. Questions are coming in thick and fast now, so I might switch to the other one. Um, Sandra mentioned the importance of a continued uh, focus on adaptation. Do the panel feel the need for investment in adaptive measures as being overshadowed by net zero targets? And if so, how do we overcome this? I would like to just comment something very quickly on, on this one. Um, I think uh, uh, um, when when the whole uh, net zero came, definitely like brought the the, um, the mitigation side of the conversation like to, to the spotlight, and definitely created like a shadow. And then they created the res the, the resilience um, a campaign, a race to resilience campaign. Uh, for instance, in the collaboration with the champions and, and and other actors, but. The truth is that the financial mechanisms are still investing far more in mitigation than on adaptation. And I think this is primarily because donors, financial mechanisms, and other actors are not, um, are not understanding the dynamics of adaptation. As I was saying, adaptation is not something that you can do with a project. Adaptation is a process, and we have to understand it as something that will take time. And sometimes donors, sometimes financial mechanisms do not want to take that time to, to see, a, you know, like results. They want to see like, okay, in one year, I want to change like this uh, technology for this other, and I want to see some changes. And I think this is precisely one of the things that we have to change in the conversation. And this has to be part of the conversation in the context of the GCF, the Green Climate Fund, the Adaptation Fund, the CIFs, the Climate Investment Funds. And we have to start analyzing more that this is not only a, a matter of vulnerability populations because people tend to think that adaptation is something that we, we have to do only in the vulnerable countries or only in the poorest uh, populations, but actually the actual uh, industries are vulnerable as well. If you go to the mining sector or whichever sector you want to mention, all of them are vulnerable and they have to implement uh, adaptation mechanisms to survive to the old changes. Mm -hmm. So adaptation is not something that we have to, to start just putting in, in that box. And we have to start thinking in a most, more cross-cutting approach, creating projects that have both mitigation and adaptation. Otherwise, 
we will end up again in the same cycle that we have been uh, facing in, in, in all these years. Thank you. I might target this one at you, um, Amai Lee. Uh, international financiers would need to be confident in the feasibility of net zero projects. Uh, is any work being done to address the issue? Uh, we know one particular platform developed by the Canadian government which uh, has the capacity to address this issue. Are there any efforts to standardise the feasibilities? Thank you. Yes. Um, I mean, that's uh, so that's interesting because I think uh, it sort of goes back a little bit to what I was saying is that there's there's a focus now on standardization uh, so that uh, you start to have more uh, you know, helps create more transparency around uh, what you know, whether a project really is uh, net zero aligned or not. I think we're also seeing a number of, you know, interesting tools for the financial sector starting to emerge to look at, uh, to improve how we would assess the financed emissions. So um, there's the Partnership for Carbon, Carbon Accounting in the financial sector, PCAF, which is sort of becoming gold standard. Um, and that's kind of a I guess it's emerging as a global platform, but it also has regional platforms. It began starting in the Netherlands. There's There was recently a UK sort of uh, consortium sort of came together. Oh, okay. She did warn us that that might happen. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, another question we have here. Oh, am I Liz back? Back to you. Very sorry, my Zoom. I it's the, sorry about this. Uh, um, so so yes, yeah, so sorry. I'm, I, I think uh, I was just saying that uh, you know we're starting to see um, some useful sort of platforms that are providing tools and sort of a common methodology around how you assess uh, the carbon. Or through the financial sector. So, um, you know, as going back to this issue of it being scope three emissions is you've got to then understand what the underlying emissions are of whatever you're financing. And it's just that much more complex than just looking at your own scope three emissions. So, um, so I think uh, the PCAF, as I mentioned, is I think becoming a sort of good global standard and, and we're working uh, with them also to look at how we can help roll that out into, for example, in Africa. Now they're talking about a platform for Africa so that you can bring the financial sector in Africa can, can use this tool, which is you know relatively user friendly and um, use that tool so that we start to be able to have a much better assessment around these issues. But, but I, th I would say there's still some way to go on the links between financed emissions and actual the extent to which they are fully net zero aligned. Uh, I think that's still work that needs to be done over the next year or so. Thank you. We have a question from Tim Street. What is your view of the value of energy attribute certificates which are voluntary and actively traded in New Zealand and helping to fund new investment such as renewable generation? I mean, I'm happy to have a quick go at that. I don't know, is is this a particular renewable, so it's a renewable trade, tradable renewable system that you have in New Zealand already, but it's voluntary, is that right? To within New Zealand or is it international? I mean, because I think I think that you know these are interesting in some respects. I think um, you know, very much uh, can help bring uh, renewable energy into, you know, parts of the economy or certain communities or certain countries where, you know, that it may not be affordable. Um, you can start to have that, you know, where there isn't necessarily the renewable resources in that particular location. It can be a very good way of, um, of uh, you know, helping to promote uh, the market, renewable energy market. I think, though, uh, going back to this issue of of net zero, I think I think that we need to be a little bit careful over um, 
you know, this issue of uh, additionality uh, in terms of contributing towards a net zero target. Um, but, but again, not being so familiar with the, this particular system in New Zealand, um, I, you know, I don't want to really comment too much more in case I've uh, uh, misunderstood the question. Rod, do you have anything to add on that one? Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's an interesting question. There isn't so much a specific market for renewables, but the challenge for New Zealand, for instance, is that we have a bunch of generators of electricity who have portfolios, um, some of which portfolios for those generators are entirely renewables, hydro, geothermal, wind and solar. And then there are other generators who still have fossil um, technologies in their portfolios, uh, predominantly coal and fossil gas. But all of the power is basically pumped into the grid. And then any particular consumer is arguably buying that blended mix of generation when they switch on their lights or turn on their boilers. So while some of the generators like to pitch that they are entirely renewable energy producers and therefore come to us as consumers, um, it's not actually a fair representation of what's going on in the New Zealand electricity market, where essentially the backup in the market is provided by some for the benefit of all. And I think that really goes to one of the hearts of, of when is this greenwashing uh, making everybody feel good about buying something as distinct from the reality, which is somewhere in our system, we are burning coal because we have not built enough renewables to meet the demand that we now face because our hydro lakes are empty and one of our natural gas fields is struggling. So, you know, it's sort of like, how do you get an informed public debate so that people who want to do the right thing are in fact doing the right thing? And that becomes quite challenging even in a small country let alone in a large, complex system such as Europe or North America. Thanks, Rod. Um, could, could one of you share your experiences of Indigenous communities accessing climate finance? I can go first. Maybe Sandra can also talk about Avena Moli. Uh, but here, uh, what has been working, uh, what was working before the situation we are now at uh, was related to financing um, the plans of indigenous community. And so not projects specifically, but what we call the life plans. So the, the indigenous peoples have their own ideas of how their development should, should be and how they can sustain and even increase their resilience uh, before uh, climate risks. And so we financing this through packages. Uh, and we had established a fund here, which was the Amazon fund that was precisely to kind of sustain this like long-term plans. I think that was a, a great a great thing and also a great opportunity to learn about how do you match uh, climate finance, of course, grants in this case, with this uh, long-term uh, horizons of planning uh, of them. Um, did I, just before, if anyone, no one else has anything to ask on that, if we're going to run over just slightly because I know there's one more question that our panellists are keen to ask. So uh, we're just interested to hear the panellists' thoughts on the beginning deliberations of the post-2025 finance goal. What should be included in such a goal and what should negotiators be considering? Thank you, Charlie. I would like to comment on that one and probably I'm going to add something precisely about the indigenous uh, uh, communities uh, work on, on this. First of all, I think the, the, the major problem that we had with the 100 billions, as you know, is that it's a political uh, number. There is not evidence about why they came with this 100 billion uh, approach in back in 2009. And the massive opportunity that we have now is to have a number that is based on the needs, on the actual needs of developing countries. It is true that developing countries are not necessarily clear about how much do they need to accomplish or to comply with the NDCs. But this is precisely the opportunity that we have. How to ensure that developed countries support developing countries in, in those processes 
to analyze how much uh, they, they, do, they need to, to implement mitigation and adaptation actions, not only consulting the central governments, but actually do comprehensive local processes that really come, uh, uh, brings those numbers uh, in that the developing countries can report through their national communications or the biennial of the two reports, all of, all of these uh, mechanisms. And how these numbers are going to are going to uh, come to the negotiations to really um, feed the conversation. But I think one key element is that the the number is not only the number is not what matters, but the actual process to get to that number. If it is only a political number, it's not going to work because it doesn't matter if it is 100, 500, whatever number it is. If they have clear idea of what are those needs and connect those needs with these numbers and then deliver in, in how the developed countries will deliver those numbers in, in the whatever long-term climate finance plan is. So I think it's very, very important to focus in the process. It's, it's insist, I insist the methodology has to consider not only uh, the, the, how to uh, put the numbers from the top down approach, but particularly from the bottom up approach. And this includes the necessities of those actors such as indigenous communities, uh, uh, women movements, and a lot of uh, um, uh, stakeholders that are doing a lot of things already, and they need that support to continue those actions. So I think this is the massive opportunity that we have to start thinking in how to put together these, these data from the bottom up and bring those elements to the actual negotiation. Otherwise, we will have another political commitment that won't be, will be there, but it's not going to really change anything of the, of the reality because it's not gonna help us to, to really be more effective in terms of, of the climate finance approaches. So yeah, I would like to, to, to conclude with that. Thank you, Charlie. Thank you, Natalie or Amelie. Did you have anything to add to that? We're happy to run over a couple of minutes if you would like to chip in. <laughs> yes, thank you so much for the question. I uh, believe this is a very important topic for COP26. Without a clear answer uh, to, to climate finance, we will probably enter a crisis of trust. Actually, maybe we are already <laughs> into it. And, and that's very problematic to the legitimacy of the, the Paris uh, regime as a whole. So this is critical. We need to be very careful. And I think to solve this, I first of all, I agree with the points that Sandra brought in. I think we need a clear definition, evidence-based. Uh, at the same time, I think we need a better uh, picture of what is public finance and what public finance will be uh, will be uh, directed. There are many countries, many developing nations talking about the 100 billion US dollars as a, as a floor, not a ceiling. So this is another important dimension. And, and, and last but not least, I think predictability. I think more than just the number itself, we need to know if there will be future financial flows and we need to be clear on who will be providing. So uh, the sort of MRV or the quantification, the verification of climate finance um, from uh, coming from developed countries is also very important to kind of uh, bring more clarity and build more trust also uh, between the different uh, groups. Thank you. Yeah. And yeah, I mean, I'll ju just add to that because I think, you know, the 100 billion has been, I mean, it's been a very important part of uh, the negotiations. And as I think Natalie emphasized, then it's also key to trust uh, within the negotiations. But it, it was a political construct. I think also, you know, moving forward, in addition to looking at whatever number or goal may be agreed, I think it's also important to think about the quality and also the inclusivity of climate finance. You know, quality, I think, means that we have to use and, and assuming, you know, this is sort of public finance in particular, which is relatively scarce and, you know, particularly the use of grant funding, which is really scarce, you know, needs to be used in a way to have, you know, the greatest impact. And often the, that won't mean big 
projects, some very small types of projects may be really, really impactful. But a lot of those are being overlooked because I think everyone's chasing after the big ticket items so they can meet these big targets that that they have. And I'm talking particularly about, say, the, the development finance uh, world, like whether DFIs, MDBs, et cetera. I think also we have to look at inclusivity because, as we know, many of the, I mean, not, well, the poorest countries, so the LDCs have benefited very little from climate finance. And also those communities, particularly how to get to more local uh, local adaptation in particular, uh, those local needs are also, um, it's also not, uh, you know, that climate finance is not getting down to that local level in many, many cases. And I think it relates to the point and question that um, uh, Natalie responded to around, you know, indigenous communities and, uh, you know, and how are they able to access and benefit from climate finance. So not just quantity, but let's also focus on quality and inclusivity of climate finance. Thank you all. That was awesome. Um, we will wrap up. Sorry for, um, for running a few minutes over and thank you to those of you who stayed on um, and to everyone who's joined us today. And I just want to apologise. There was a bit of a technical glitch at the start where some of you were unable to access the session. Um, so we tried to jump onto it as soon as we could and send the link out. Um, and then it was fantastic to see so many of you join. Uh, we will send a link to the recording around um, as soon as we can so you can catch any of the start that you did miss. Um, and a huge thank you to Amelie, Sandra and Natalie for taking the time to join us today. It was so fantastic to hear from you and we feel really privileged to have had you with us. So thank you. Um, and thanks to Lisa and Rod for leading the session for us. Um, I know Lisa has had to drop off um, for another appointment, so she does send her apologies. Um, but we hope that you enjoy the rest of your day or evening, wherever you are. Um, I'm just going to hand over to Sandra to close the session for us with a karakia. Kia ora, Sandra. Kia ora, Charlie. Can you see me? He karakia whakakapi. Ka whakairea te tapu, ki a watea ai te ara, ki a turuki whakataha ai, ki a turuki whakataha ai, hui e daikie. So restrictions have moved aside, so the pathway is clear to return to your everyday activities and reach unified and blessed. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias. And thank you to our panel and all attendees.